Yes. Okay. Now. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, I don't know if you have already had me as a teacher. Most, actually, none of you have. <coughs> Hi, ladies. Are you here for a lecture? Oh, welcome. You're late, also. <laughs> so, I am uh, Giuseppe Mazzoli. My background is uh, purely, completely, and entirely in computer science. I hold a bachelor, a master, and a PhD in computer science from the University of Venice. And my specialization is programming languages, especially functional programming languages, and game development. Just to give you a big idea. I've been working as a game developer for Microsoft for a few years, and mostly a research and a theoretical. Now, in this lecture, we're going to, first of all, introduce uh, the course, definitely. Then we'll shortly recap what we've learned so far. What we have ostensibly learned so far. Uh, then I'll introduce the basic notions of uh, types and declarations. And what those entail, what's going to be different now. And finally, I'll give a short introduction to C Sharp and Java with uh, examples of execution with the stack and the heap that you all have come to love so much. Okay? Um, now, there is another quite explicit rule, which is mobile phones may not be looked at for any reason in this classroom. Yes, these things can and will happen. Put your phone away unless someone died. Or... <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> now, uh, before we begin with the course, I have decided to let myself go to something I usually do not do. It is five minutes of pure mushiness. <laughs> now specifically, I would like to point out that the hardest part is over. It says that the hardest part was step two, was learning how to think in strong and formal terms, to let go of intuition. You should have now, by now, begun to realize that coding is not an activity like the ones you're used to. It's different. It does different and weird things to your brain. And that was the hardest part of all. This was literally the hardest part of your whole education. And that's over. So take pride in what you've done. Because doing something hard should get you proud. Uh, you are really beginning with learning how to program. And that's all. And as dev teachers, we are happy with what, with what we're seeing. Now, uh, as an aside, I have roughly 40 students that are following functional programming with third years now. And I would like to point out that first years have consistently blown third years out of the water. Nine questions over 10 have been in the class correctly answered by first years and not thirds. So this is working. Enjoy it. Because when things work, it's awesome. There is value in things that work. Uh, also, I would like to point out that what you are doing here, learning how to program, it's awesome. This expands your horizon. This gives you the possibility to, to create new things, to automate thoughts, to literally automate the most precious thing known to humans, that is our thought processes. This is beautiful. Enjoy the beauty of it, because learning this is the most awesome thing that is known nowadays to the fucking whole of mankind. So this is an awesome place to be. Realize it. It's a great privilege to be here. Now, the mushiness is now over. And to counterbalance that, I'll present the exam. Now, the exam is written again. You get not four. This is a major change, actually. You get now two open questions, which are stack and heap and type like declarations, which is more stack and heap, basically. That's all we, need to, we ask you. Why? Because you need to know how the machine works to be able to debug it. When it doesn't do what you expect, you have to be able to look at the code and in your mind go through it and say, what would this do? And you compare what it exactly does with what you want it to do. And you typically, those things are not the, same. not the same. And then you adjust the code so that hopefully it does something closer to what you want. Um, you get a go or a no go depending on the score. Uh, then you get a bunch of exercises, which are in a separate repository on GitHub. Have you found the GitHub repositories? All of you? Raise your hand. With 
You haven't found it. Oh, yeah, yeah. What's your... Okay, so everyone has found it. If you haven't, after a lecture, come closer. I'll show you how to open a browser and type in the URL and find these things. There is also another repository which is called InfDev Homework, which contains a load of exercises. These are not mandatory. It's a lot of small exercises which also feature solutions. The idea is that you take the exercise, you try to solve it, then you look at the solution, you compare it, you close the solution, you try again until, you know, it just clicks in. There is no break for this. This is for your benefit and enjoyment, and in the practicums, you are very free and very invited to ask for feedback on those things. So how do you do this? Why does it look like this in the solutions, etc.? Okay? Got it? I try to not when I ask questions so that I get that. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, now, uh, the assignments will be the usual. Uh, you will have to be the simulation that looks very much like the one in Dev2. But this time, with another language, Java or C Sharp, that's your choice, so that you get more structure. You should realize that the process catches more errors as you write the code. As you write the code, you will get a tool, which is a compiler. It tells you things like, you know what, well, it doesn't make much sense. Look at it again. Whereas Python accepts kind of everything, and then it fails miserably when you run the code, and you get weird errors everywhere. Now in C Sharp and Java, you get more errors up front, but you can run the code less, because you get more errors up front. But then you get more chances to talk with the machine that tells you, you know what, that, that doesn't look right. So would you please fix it, okay? It's going to be quite powerful. Um, it is mandatory, so you have to do this. You don't get the grade directly, because you get the grade with, the origin. Oh, the origin. Where? Uh, we call it origin check, but this is a bit of, a, of an abomination of a name. So basically, we push you in a big room, we tell you download from your, you, you've done it for them too, so it's going to be exactly the same. So sit here, we give you a reference solution, fix it, make it work, if you can, you can program, if you can't, oops. No, we're not going to say that. Everyone here is a special and unique snowflake. Nobody sucks, no one sucks. <laughs> Everyone <laughs> is a blue sucks. If we have to get a good grade for you all. I didn't say that. You're saying it. Now, so, uh, now, this is something that needs to be said. Uh, there is actually an expected study effort, and this expected study effort is, was also for Dev 1 and Dev 2, but this, is, this was kind of lost in translation. It is between 10 and 20 hours per, per week, okay? You know, 10 and 20 hours. Hours is when the, 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 the long line on the clock does a full, a full. It has to do 16 of those during the whole week. We do study. Now, what does study... Okay. So, what does studying mean? Studying means that you take the slides, which are on GitHub, and read all of them, left to right, top to bottom. You know, like a book. Every term on the slides has to be clear to you. If a term is not clear, now we haven't written terms here or words because we find that their music is pretty. We have written them because they describe precisely what's happening. There is precision in those slides. There are also mistakes, but we try to keep those to a minimum and the precision to a high level. The point is, every term you should understand. If you don't understand it, there are three options. One, you go to one of your awesome teachers and you ask him, or her. No, actually, you just have male teachers here. Um, what does this mean? And you will get an explanation. And you can ask other questions. It's fine. You can go to Google and just Google it and hope for the best. Or you can ask other students, which is a bit of a, you know, <laughs> this is a bit of a, of a wild bet. Uh, you could also be re-meshing re up lack of knowledge, so that's kind of risky, but you can still try. Uh, now, every sample of code on the slides is there to be tried out on your machine. So get the code, copy it in Java, Eclipse, NetBeans, IntelliJ, don't care. Copy it in Visual Studio if it's C-sharp, run it. But before you run it, what do you do? Read, Read it and understand. understand it. And when do you understand code? When do you understand code? <laughs> when you think about the output before the output is given and it's right. When you think about the output before the output is given and it's right. Kind of makes sense, right? If you can program something, you should also be able to read it <coughs> and know what it does in advance. If you don't even know what existing code does in advance, how can you possibly write new code that is correct, right? It all begins with reading code. 
not the most, not, not the sexiest activity in the world, but a very productive one. Now, um, on an unrelated note, when I say 10 and 20 hours of this kind of stuff, uh, I do not really mean that you have two monitors and on one monitor you're checking 9 gig out and on the other you have the slides open but you don't look at them. They're just open. Yeah, so, so um, when you, now this is something that's a bit hard to explain but I'll, I'll try. You know what the, the zone is? Yeah. No, no, no this, is, this is actually a serious bit. You know what the zone is? When your focus closes completely into something. Completely. The whole world has to disappear. The whole world. If there's something else distracting you, if there's a phone buzzing, if there's, uh, I don't know, your crush texting you and it distracts you, that is not going to work. That breaks hours of study. The zone is complete and utter focus. You're hunting something. You're hunting the truth. And the truth runs very fast. You have to focus. The focus cannot be broken for a second. That is it. That's the reason why you don't keep alt tabbing onto something else. You don't keep looking at notifications. This is studying. It is like climbing a mountain. It's heavy. It requires focus. It requires dedication. But when you get to the top, it is beautiful. And there is the top. And it's not that hard to reach. It requires focus and dedication. Got it? I hope this helps actually, because the, 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 the expectation is this. So if you do this, I, I bet my balls that every single one can get it. But if you don't, there's nothing I can do. This you can only do yourselves. Now, uh, what have we, hopefully, learned so far that we're going to build over in this course? Let's begin with the code. Now, we have seen. The program counter, the stack, and the heap. How do they work? Why have we seen that instead of just talking about Python? Why have we really wanted to emphasize the existence of something weird like the program counter, the stack, and the heap? Please shout it. Because they are universal. That's not shouting. I'm not really kidding. Yes, sir. Because they are universal. Because they apply to every single programming language. You know why? Because all those things, all those machines, internally, you could say they have a program counter, a stack, and a heap. So any language that's going to run on one of those, so any language, any programming language, is going to have to do something with the program counter, the stack, and the heap. So this means that you learn the program counter, the stack, and the heap, and you have, to an extent, learned how all programming languages work. Now, how many programming languages do exist? Let's see. Okay, let's. I'll, I'll make a proposal. Stop me when the when, when you think I'm right. One, two, okay, four, twenty, two hundred, yes. thousands. <laughs> the number in the thousands. Okay. So, can you learn them all apart? Does that seem like a viable strategy to you? You learn ah, 2,000 languages. Do you think that 10 years from now we'll have more or less programming languages? There is a bunch of suckers that have nothing to do all day that are now trying to build new languages. Like me, exactly. Yeah, sorry guys. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing my best uh, to make your life work. So in the coming 10 years, as you're professionals and you have 40 years to go, maybe 50 even, who knows when pension is going to come, if ever. Uh, in the coming decades, new languages will be developed all the time. So how do you survive this? By learning the basic principles. Do you see another way? Do you see another option? You don't. And you know why? Is the reason. Now, uh, we've also seen Basic constructs of code like variables, conditionals, loops, primitive data types like integers, strings, floats, etc. And we've seen customizable abstractions, so ways to extend the language as we need. And those are functions, recursive functions, that are functions that can deal with arbitrarily big problems to solve, classes, and methods. And these are customizable, so whenever we find a problem, we can tailor the solution to the problem 
by building pieces of the answer, by capturing into these abstractions, into functions, classes, etc., the pieces of the solution that we then need to assemble into the bigger solution, the whole thing. Now, in this course, we move from Python to Java and C sharp. Now, um, these languages are an extension of Python in the sense that they have additional features, but the basics of those things we've seen, they come back with slightly different aesthetic appearance, so they look a bit different, but you will recognize most things. Um, we are going to teach both, to, both of them. Why? Does anyone have any idea why we're going to do both? Besides inherent evil. Because they are... Because they're similar. Because they're very similar. So, one, you kind of get the other for free. Uh, also, uh, each one apart has some slight limitations. So the idea is that by learning them together, we cover a gigantic chunk of relevant stuff for today. Uh, you may pick one of the two for the assignments. You don't need to pick up. <coughs> My body is slowly giving up. Uh, so, yeah. Now, um, uh, you may pick one to learn to program into, but recognize both. Learn both. At, a, at least at a theoretical, at a superficial level. Then you learn to use one well. You choose whichever you want. They're fine. They're both very fine languages. Now, the choice should be based on this analysis. Java is dominantly used in business. So businesses that do most business applications tend to, have to, to do them in Java. Uh, it has a gigantic ecosystem of tools, libraries, uh, compile system, etc. It has very good support on most platforms. And has a large community with dozens of libraries for most common tasks. On the other hand, C Sharp is dominant in semi-high performance applications, so games, simulations, Unity, etc. If you do want to enter that world, which is also a word, by the way, yes, absolutely, then go for C Sharp. Uh, and the design has been made by a bunch of incredibly smart people, stolen for a few years from academia, that have provided an incredibly clean design. So of the two, as, just as a language, you know, outside the applications, C Sharp is prettier. If you want to go for elegance and prettiness, go for C Sharp. Now, life is... Life sucks occasionally, so prettiness is also something of that one. Uh, and there's now good support, but not excellent, on most platforms thanks to, thanks to Mono and the open sourcing of .NET. On the other hand, they also have uh, minus points. Now, Java is slow to evolve. How slow? Factor in some 10 years too late in implementing new stuff. 10 years. So you're dead before you... So you're going to be dead before you see some cool features in Java. You can assume that. Uh, but it stays consistent, you know. Uh, and uh, it is quite an older language, actually. It was more experimental than Java, because it started than C Sharp. Java was created far sooner than C Sharp. So uh, Java has more concessions to, 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 to pragmaticity that resulted in some ugly choices. There are corner cases. I, I recently was experimenting with the language, and I got uh, through with advanced features of the language, and uh, I got an uncompilable code exception at some point, which is so. I, it is you can break the language quite easily, well, not quite easily, but you can break it because it, it makes weird assumptions. It's a bit weaker on some on some things, especially in the support of genetics. Um, and there are corner cases. So sometimes you, you, you encounter invisible brick walls. You know, you're running happily, and you crush your nose against something invisible. And the language tells you, yeah, you know, that. It makes sense, but we're not going to do it. It happens. So that, that's my story. On the other hand, uh, C Sharp, uh, C Sharp still has a strong stigma of, of, of the evil of Microsoft in the 90s. Microsoft was kind of a sucky company in the 90s. Uh, and this, this, doesn't, this, this rubs onto things easily. So lots of people, when they hear C Sharp, they think, oh my god, Microsoft is going to buy us and then uh, sell us for pieces. Uh, it is not nice. Uh, also, it has a much smaller, not much, but it has a smaller community. There are less libraries that do things. So choose whichever you like most. Both languages are supported and accepted, and we're going to do our best to help you. Now, every teacher is slightly better in one or the other, but we will help you in both. Um, the differences are minimal, so learn to see the differences. Learn both of them. You need to choose just one. That's important. 
Now, let's move on from Python to Java and C Sharp. First of all, a notice. In Python, as you certainly remember, you just take an empty file, start writing code, you press the green triangle button, and the code tries to do something. Okay? Now, C Sharp and Java, on the other hand, uh, cannot just accept any bit of code, but they require more structure. So most of the code that we see during this lecture cannot just be copied and pasted from the slides into, into Java or C Sharp and be run. It will not be accepted. So in the next lecture, we'll see what you need to actually start the program. Sorry? The, the main. Yes, exactly. So all snippets of Java and C Sharp that we see now cannot, until we see the concept of the main function inside the class program, cannot just be pasted in Netify and run like we did for Python. This is one of the major reasons actually why we use Python, that you can just experiment with it much quicker without needing uh, the 50 lines of, uh, of, of pointless code to, to just make it. Now, most basic Python constructs translate almost directly to Java and C Sharp. And by basic constructs, I mean something like 10 plus 20. This is Python. And this is C Sharp. Now, what differences do you notice? Look carefully. First of all, I'm saying that x is an integer. What does that mean? Uh, that we have to decide what sort of parameter we use. Yes. So we have to constrain what sort of data can go into a variable. Now, we will get quite deep into this because this is the most major difference between Java, C Sharp, and Python. And it, makes, it means that we cannot just put a string into X. The language will say, whoa, stop for a second. What are you doing there? And this means that this prevents a lot of errors because whenever you try to put a string into an integer, that means that your expectation is that that variable will be an integer. And you're breaking your own promise to the machine. And do you like people that break promises? So you shouldn't be one yourself. Now, uh, also, what else do you notice? Semicolon. The semicolon. <coughs> now, C Sharp and Java come from a rich tradition. Uh, from a time when we had a world supply of semicolons that was still very, very high, much higher than now, actually. So it was decided that semicolons would be cheap enough to, to get in large quantities to put at the end of every single statement there. If you forget one, the language will request it and gracefully tell you to go fetch a semicolon. Um, uh, so, okay, these are the two most obvious differences. Now, notice that we have alternatives. Uh, we can, for example, uh, first declare and then use the variable. Or we can declare and assign the variable right away. Okay? The second one is typically preferred because uh, there is a limbo here between instructions 1 and 2. And what's the value of x between 1 and 2? Uh, random, random stuff that was already there at the memory. Actually, you just don't know. You typically do not know. You have to look into the specification of the language to know. But, I mean, that means that another programmer comes, has no idea as well. So, that alternative is less pretty. It's valid, but it's less pretty. When you don't know stuff, anything that you do not control yourself is going to, I mean, when you program, whenever you do something carelessly, that, yes, yes, please, please. That was exactly the expression I was going to say. Seriously? Yes. It's going to bite you in the ass. It is going to bite you in the ass, eventually. Okay? So the, the machine is against you. It looks for errors that you made, and it uses them against you. It's, it's like a, an ex-wife in a divorce court, you know? Okay. Now, um, in Java, the snippet of C sharp, the first one becomes like this. Uh, do you know these differences? No, I don't. Yes. And you know why you don't know these differences? Because it's exactly because the same. Because it's exactly the same. Yes. Uh, the other piece of code, the second one, you notice the differences here? No. Also exactly the same. Also because they are exactly the same. Yes. Um, now, 
this piece of code that we've seen, which we can't just copy and paste it because we don't have the name yet, would produce, if we ran it, the same execution in both Python and Java and C-Sharp. So, I know you were all waiting for the moment when the second heap would come back into the picture, and so here they are. I will give you five seconds to enjoy the idea. <coughs> okay, now, uh, what happens if I press this button that goes to the next slide? What's going to appear there? The program counter is going to become two. And then? Sorry? Yes. It's going to add x to the stack with value with value 30. So we get x is 30 and the program counter is 2. Yes. Sorry? Uh, because we move to the next instruction. <coughs> so whenever we have an instruction that is outside the program, the program is terminated. The program is over. Okay? okay. So you could imagine that right there, line two, which you don't see, is a special line which is close the program. Oh, okay. okay? It's invisible because it's not a real instruction, but what we what the what the program does is it adds a special instruction at the end that says, you know what, clean memory up and close this. I close the window. Okay? Now, uh, Java and C Sharp support a similar set of primitive data types. So we have, uh, we have integers in various sizes, bytes, short, etc. These you will learn to understand as you encounter them. It doesn't matter that much that I list them. But you have integers with various sizes. So you can have variables that can store more or less data in them. Uh, you have floats in various sizes, you have float and double, uh, and you have strings, you have booleans, etc. Now you will slowly encounter them. I'm not going to just list them all because it would be boring, but realize that now we have a bunch of basic data types. And these data types are to an extent, well, richer than Python because now we can specify how much data we want to be able to store. If we know that we're just going to have integers between 0 and 50, we don't need to use int or long. We can just use a byte or a short which is more, uses less memory. It's nice to be able to do. Memory is cheap, but not that cheap. If you have to allocate a billion of these things, then you might as well be able to save it. Now, every one of these primitive data types has a different range. You know what the range is? <coughs> right. Yeah. It's how many things fit inside one. So the byte is just not surprisingly, one byte of size, which is eight bits, and it stores values, uh, 256 values. Actually, that's a, that's a typo in slide. It's between zero and 255. So very small integers. Then a short is two bytes. It goes from minus 32,768 to 32,767. Int is four bytes. It goes from minus 2 to the power of 31 to 2 to the power of 31 minus 1. That's in the 2 billion range. So it goes from minus 2 billions to plus 2 billions. That's a big number. Uh, longs are even bigger. They're 2 to the power of uh, minus 2 to the power of 63, 2 to the power of 63 minus 1. Longs are very big. So you know those numbers when people say more than the number of grains of sand in the universe, whatever. So it's, it can store very big numbers. Uh, Floats are for bytes. You remember what floats are? <coughs> so ints or integer numbers. What kind of data can they, the, the, the data in integers? What's the step between different values, different integers? Oh, come on. Yes. Whole numbers. Sorry? Whole numbers. So what is the step between them? No, no, wait a second. In int, for ints, for integers. What's the step between them? One. Yes. <coughs> step is one. <coughs> the other hand, float is the step one. It is not exactly what I really want. That is which we do. But almost. It is customizable. Specifically, floats can have steps between them 
that are very small, like 0 0.0001. Doubles, which are the richer, the more powerful alternative to flows, have an even smaller steps. Now you can imagine doubles can store 0 0.0000000000001. Stuff like that. Okay? Can you check if he's following the rules? Did someone die? Um, no. Someone gonna die if you don't send a message? Um, no. Is that gonna catch you late? <laughs> no? I'll pay attention. Okay. But if the answer to any of those questions is correct, just raise your finger and I'll leave you alone. Now, so, um, in some cases, you do get bugs that depend on the fact that you pick one of those values and it wasn't powerful enough to, co to store the information you wanted. You know what happens, for example, if you have a short that's by unfortunate chance 32,767 and you add one to it, what do you think happens? It becomes um, yeah. It does full circle. So what you get, and that is problematic, that you go from 32,767 to minus 32,760, which is embarrassing, because now adding, adding one has resulted in a number that's not bigger but smaller. All sorts of things break then spectacularly. So pick the right number, and don't be a cheap bastard. Memory is cheaper than bugs. Now, Python operators translate almost directly to Java and C uh, The only exception are the logical operators, not becomes an exclamation mark, or become two bars, not four, just two, that's a typo. The two bars. And becomes a double ampersand. So this, for example, would be a Boolean condition. 10 plus 20 divided by 2 greater than 5. Greater than 5. Why is it a Boolean condition? Why is it a Boolean value instead of an int? Because it, because it compares. So that is a comparison. And the comparison is between 5 on the right hand and 10 plus 20 divided by 2 on the other side. Okay? So being a comparison, it results in an answer of the sort. What are the values of Boolean? True or false. True or false. Now, in C sharp, we would have to declare B as a Boolean. Is that very surprising so far? <coughs> no? Good. Now, in Java, this becomes actually this is a typo. This is not bool, but boolean. I'm going to fix it later. Yeah, there are plenty of typos. Yeah. I put love in the slides, but that's the never yes. enough. Yes, it only just bites you in the S. So, uh, that is a dramatic difference. So, I understand it. It makes the two languages very different now. Instead of writing bool, you write boolean. I'm going to correct in a bit of an analog way. So it's taken on camera as well. So saying hello to the future watchers. Now, um, this piece of code, what is it, it going to produce? What's going to happen now? The PC counter becomes 2. The program counter becomes 2, yes, and? It will add the, the value B to the stack. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the B. variable B, not the value. And uh, and it becomes true. And uh, value B becomes true. And value B will become true. Yes. And that's it. We're done. Now, <coughs> uh, function calls in Python look very much the same as those in Java and C sharp. That is, name of the function, brackets, parameters separated by commas. So this is an example. Now, obviously, the, the names of the functions will not be the same. I hope you were not expecting this. If you were, well, go to shower here. Now, print int in this reads input, then converts it to an integer and gives an error otherwise, and then prints the integer. Good. Now in C sharp, this becomes brackets are missing. Someone has touched my slide generator, and I'm going to have to keep it. Brackets <laughs> missing. Oh, I, I see blood in my picture. 
and they're actually someone else's picture. Bracket, 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 bracket. Okay? So, console.write line is the function that writes a string on the output. In 32 the parse takes a string and turns it into an integer. And console.readline does reads a line of input. Got it? Good. So, uh, in Java, these are just other function codes. Just, just look at the slides on Google. Okay. Sorry? It's not getting easy. What? Oh. Come on, if I can sprint, and then I which one to print the line. I and look at that. But this is just verbosity. It's, it's, it's nothing. These are just things that, I mean, that's, that's actually Java and C Sharp as languages are so verbose that I suspect they are the reason why we have editors with intelligence. Because of the pain of writing that much. Now, uh, what does this do? No, no, without the stupid brackets. So, with brackets. What do you think this is going to do? It will write 100 on the console, right? So, in steps, first of all, the program counter stays 1, but console.readline eats up this input here, which was 100. Is this an int or a string? As we did. It's a string. Why is it a string? Because it's typed by the user on the console. It's a string. But the machine doesn't know yet that it's an int. It doesn't care. Then, the input disappears. Why has the input disappeared? Why do I take it off? Because the function input has ended, maybe? Because console.readline has eaten the input away. So we take it off. Because if you do console.readline twi twice, what is that going to do? Is that going to read the same line? No. no. Every time, it's going to read another line. Then it goes, uh, it actually goes in the heap, yes. It takes it and copies the string in the heap and gives us back a reference to the string. Oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, typically when someone says the word heap or stack, I'm just ready, you know, to say, yeah, just, but not. But in this case, got it, got it. Now, then, uh, in 32 of parse, converts 100 to 100. But is that the same 100? No. No? Because now it's an integer. And then we write the integer out. But when we write it, is it an integer or a string? It is a string. Because we can read the input and write output always as a string. This is an example of a bit of an idiot, of an idiot program that, that just, you know, convert it to an integer, then reconvert it back to a string. But we do it because we can. Also because this gives us an error if the input wasn't an input. If the input was a string that could not be converted to an integer, then we get an error at runtime, which might be what we needed. So it might be that we rather see the program stop than go ahead with an output that is meaningless. You get what I'm saying? So we might want the program to fail if the input was not an integer, which in this case we have done. This is not a program that is entirely stupid. We're going to take a break. I've been told by some that I speak fast, which is not my experience at all. I, I find myself to be extremely slow when paced. <laughs> but if you want, we can take a break. Uh, we take a break. I see people say, yes, it's not a break. That's not the proper way to take a break. But yeah, go on. But it's always going to succeed. Oh, no, it runs. Uh, it runs until here. So look, it reads the input, which is not a string. <laughs> then it gives the string to in 32 the parse. He fails and gives you an error. It gives a runtime error. It says, I can't go on. I stop here. And the program stops. OK? Good. Uh, could you wait? Yeah. Supplies are much higher. 
but also the curly bracket supply was much higher. It was decided in such a time of happiness and abundance that every single block of code would be surrounded by curly brackets, which makes the language become much more verbose in terms of lines written. Uh, there are no more columns, like in Python to the limit, things like an if or a while or a declaration or function, etc. You know, the word columns a bit in many places in Python. No more. Uh, indentation remains important, but the language doesn't care anymore. The language only cares about the semicolons and the brackets and the curly brackets. So you you, you might, in theory, not indent. But that is strongly connected to the desire of passing the course. So that means if you do not indent, you will be failed on evenly on purpose. We don't really uh, imagine you're a teacher and you have to grade things from 80, 90 students. These big one-liners, unstructured. No, that's not going to work. So make sure that you indent code as you would in Python. Okay? The same rules apply. It's only for prettiness, as I told you already, life is ugly enough to not try to make things a bit more peaceful. Now, uh, <coughs> statements in Python, like ifs, translate <coughs> almost directly to Java and C sharp. Uh, the only difference are brackets and the lack of semicolon. So, x is equal to int of input, we need an input. If x is greater than 0, we print greater, else we print smaller or equal. Becomes in C sharp, int x is equal to int reduced bars console read line. Then, if x greater than zero, notice is there a semicolon? Is there a colon there? No. There is, on the other hand, a curly bracket. Curly bracket, which is then closed in line. Four, yes. Then the else has another curly bracket that opens and is then closed at line six. Very good. In Java, this uh, becomes dramatically different. Or not really. It is still the same thing with different function names for the library function. So this was console.write line, it's now system.out.println, blah, blah, blah. Okay? Yes? No semicolon? Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Forgot to. We'll fix later. Well, semi uh, there, are, there is a semicolon. But I can fix it now. Yeah. If you see these mistakes, please point them out also on uh, the GitHub issues page. You can open an issue, you can open a ticket, and we will fix it eventually. Okay? No, that's a nice bit of GitHub. So it's not a one directional thing. Uh, now, this snippet, what does it produce? What do you think? What happens when I press the next button? Program counter goes to? No, it doesn't. The program counter goes to two. Then, what happens to the input? It goes away, it disappears. Why? Because we've read it. <coughs> input has disappeared, we parse the integer. And what happens fur on the stack? Yes? X becomes 100. Okay? Now, if I click again, what's going to happen? Ah, look at me in the eyes, now you have to answer. Okay, counter goes to three. Why does it go to three? Who? Spear. But what is X? X is just a state. X is just a name of writing. Program counter is going to go to three. 
But how do we determine that? What does the if do? Yes, but x is just, just, just a name. It checks the value of x to be greater than 0. So what does it really check? Does it check x greater than 0? It checks 100 greater than 0. Is 100. So x greater than 0, it, begins, it means nothing. You can't say x greater than 0. But you, what you can do is you can take the value of x, put it in place of x, and the value is 100. How do we know that the value is 100? We were just looking at No, 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 no. It's simpler. Yes, please shout it. We look in the stack. We look in the stack. So we look in the stack. And the big value of x, which is 100, it's written in the under it, so you know it's his stuff. And we put 100 here instead of x. And then we check, is 100 greater than 0? Is it? So it's not this nebulous thingy of we check x greater than 0, which is confusing. No, we check 100 greater than 0. Is there anyone here that would dare challenge the claim that 100 is greater than 0? No, there isn't. Or, well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> the mental hospital. So, 100 is greater than 0. Yes, program counter becomes 3. Okay, then, what happens? <coughs> the output becomes greater, <coughs> program counter goes to? Output becomes greater, program counter becomes actually 4 because we conclude the thing, and then program counter just slips away and the program is done. Got it? Is there a difference with Python that you have Python, I guess, not went on to program counter for, but then you said like it was outside the loop? No, no, I'm just not drawing it here. But what, what the program counter does next, and I'm not showing it because I find it interesting. So the program counter, where, where does it jump now? To the last bracket. It jumps here. Uh, and it flows off the program. Okay? It's so exactly like Python. I mean, the point of the if is that it's going to skip the second bit. Right? Good. Now, let's consider a while loop. Now, the only bit that's going to show now is we need some input. We call it x, and it's going to be an integer. Then the counter CNT, you know what CNT stands for? Counter. Yes. Counter begins at 0. Then, as long as x is greater than 0, Count is incremented by 1, and x is divided by 2. So first of all, what is this program doing? What's it counting, really? How many times uh, the input value of x changes into the base? How many times the input can be divided by 2? Ah, and here, I will offer you a fair. <laughs> this was a very good characterization. So we count how many times x can be divided by 2. OK, good. Now, if you look at C sharp, besides the semicolons, minus possible bugs, minus any, uh, y, node, colon, bracket, bracket. OK? Is, do you think this is very different then? Yes. No. Dramatically? Yes. It's not dramatically uh, different. The Python code. Python code um, goes on much longer because the x gets turned into a float. No, no. Once it, yes. No, yes, but if you... Oh, in Python 3? Yeah. Oh, yes, okay. <laughs> I'm using no. Yes. Nice catch. Fair enough. All yeah, right. I'm assuming the division of semantics of Python 2. Uh, now, that's something I really hate about Python 3, that it does this weird thing of... You know, this, that's an issue actually in Python. It can <coughs> make you go crazy because it, it takes a freedom. Uh, look, if you look at that intuitively, that is saying x is an int. Why is that saying x is an int? Because you literally say x is the int that comes from the int. And then you divide an integer by another integer and it says, you know what, fuck you. <laughs> this is now a float. But why? You wanted an int. Ha! <laughs> it's your problem. <laughs> so that kind of sucks about Python 3. I do really, really dislike it. Uh, but some people like it. There are people that, you can find people that like anything nowadays. So. Now, um, and in Java, 
this is like again dramatically different in the sense that it's exactly the same with different function names. Now, what does this program do? Actually, what is what is going to be the final value of count? <coughs> Let's begin with this. What is the final value of count? <coughs> I will offer a chocolate to the right. guesses. <laughs> Five. Who said five? Who said five first? Oh, we don't know, so I'll offer a chocolate to myself. He said it. He said it. You said it. You said it. So the competition is between six and five. Now, uh, let's begin. What happens to the input? Because the first thing that we do is a console that we like. So what happens to the input? It disappears it gets eaten, it doesn't really disappear, but it goes internally into the, into the heap. But we don't show it because we don't show the steps inside the instruction. Uh, it disappears, then, what's that, what do we do with the uh, with stack? Program comes. Program counter goes to? Goes to two. You like skipping two. Is there some trauma there? <laughs> they were beating, you were beating, uh, beaten with a two <laughs> when you were young. It goes, from the counter it goes to two, and we add. No, we don't yet add count. We add x, the value of? Please scream it. 32. It was not screaming by any means, but we're going to pretend it was. So x goes as 32 on the stack. Then, what do we do? Program counter becomes three. Yes. What? Yes. Count is zero. Yes. Okay. That's one step in volume. Count becomes zero, and we put it. We see it on the. Yes. We see it on the stack. Now, we have to solve the why now. Hmm. Is x greater than one? Yes. So. What we really do is, okay, we would like to know if x is greater than 1, which means absolutely nothing. So, we replace x with its value, which is 32. And then we check. What do we check? And we check if 32 is greater than 1. And is it? Um, yeah, but yes, but we think the wasn't it x is greater than zero just yet? No, it wasn't. No, it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> so x is 32, 32 is greater than one. So we jump to line four. Now, what happens now? The value of x becomes 33. Not yet. No. no uh, we don't touch X. We're on line four. Yeah. On line four, so I can count. No, no, something happens. Yeah, no, it's checked. For the We're on line four. Wait, 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 wait. Count, he yeah. says C and D becomes one. The value of C and D becomes almost. Zero plus one. Zero plus one becomes C and T plus 1, but C and T is 0. So the value of C and T becomes 0 plus 1. Got it? You understand why? So we can't do C and T plus 1. It doesn't mean anything. But we know that C and T is 0. 0 plus 1 is 1. We all agree. 0 plus 1 is 1. And C and T becomes then 1. So C and T becomes 1. Program Yes? First one we jump to line two, and after that uh, x is 32. But right now we're on line four, and we're altering the value of count. The value of count, but not the value of, of, of x. Yeah, I know. I mean, so we do that on line five. Yes, that was what I was thinking. Doesn't change anything actually. But like when it was program count one, mm -hmm. we added, we added x at program count two, didn't we? We did x. No, actually, we had 
You see the value, the new value of the of count and the program counter. They appear at the same time. Yes, after the program counter is also yes. then no, it's at the same time. I both change count and the program counter at the same time. Okay? They actually happen at the same time in the CPU. The program counter changes in the <coughs> it's a separate register, it actually changes in the parallel with the rest. <coughs> then <coughs> We're at line five. <coughs> We're on line five. What happens? Someone is going to say x becomes x divided by two. Or someone is going to say x is equal to become 16. But I don't like that answer. x is 32. We divide 32 by two. And that is? And we put that into the value of x. We get x16 and the program counter is 6. And now, where do we go? Line 7. Do we check something? <coughs> no. Let's just go back to the while condition. <coughs> yes. And now, what happens? Uh, the PC counter is supposed to be at 3 while now, right? Hmm. I'm seeing a bug. Yes, absolutely. I'm wondering why. So, then we're just going to have to use our brains. What a tragedy. So, next instruction, the program counter has to go to? Has to go to three. And at three, what are we going to check? It's the value of x, which is 16 now, mm -hmm. is still greater than one. Yes. And is it 16 greater than 1? Yeah. Usually it is. Yeah. So we move on to line 4. So, as you can imagine, we keep going and going and going and going and going. And then, <coughs> oh, oh, they're shifted by 1, the program counter. It's, there's enough by 1 error. <laughs> and finally, yeah, keep going and going. It's a little bit Yeah, there's a bug in the and finally, the result is fine. Okay? Because you divide 32 by 2, and you get 16, and counter is 1. Then 16 by 2, counter is 2, and x is 8. Then 4 and 3. Then 2 and 4. Then 1 and 5. But 1 is not greater than 1, so you stop at count is equal to 5. Okay? Got it? Good. Just to clarify, the only thing is heat is now the 32 that we uh, did. There is nothing on the heat. Alright. Oh, the string, you mean? Yeah. The string, yeah, but that's only here. Yeah. Surprising. Right. Uh, oh, it's a bug in the slides. I'm going to fix it. Yes? What is the. Uh, what is the model? Then you, get, then you get count is equal to 6. Because then it's going to do 1 divided by 2, which will result into 0, because it's an int. And then the counter is going to go ahead by 1. But interestingly enough, what is 2 to the power of 5? 25. Oh, I wonder if there's a relationship. Now, uh, this concludes the first part of this lecture. The next one is going to be after the holidays, right in sync with uh, with her with her cancer. Do you have any questions? No. No. Oh, yeah, you have practicums. No. Only this one has two parts. The next one is only one part.